So I'm, I'm happy to welcome Joao. I hope this will uh, not be a problem. So we'll only admit person we know the name of, uh, obviously, uh, that have a reasonable name. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah. Uh, uh, and okay, so um, I will let the floor to Nicola and just want to let you know, so we are quite happy to welcome Joao for his seminar. And the next one will be given by, as you can see, by Anne Siegel on the, on the 26th of May. Uh, so on modeling um, biological systems by uh, reasoning or dynamic things. And Joao will speak to us about formal explanations. So uh, I will now leave the floor to Nicola that, that can introduce Joao and uh, animate the, the seminar. So, Nicola, if you want yes. to. <clears throat> Thank you, Sebastian. So maybe, Jo, in the meantime, you can share your screen. Uh, yeah, to, okay. To yes, it, it's a great pleasure to have uh, Jo uh, uh, to, to give this talk. Uh, so, this talk is supported by uh, the working group on uh, explainability. So, explainability is a huge topic, and nowadays uh, it's, uh, it become, becomes uh, even difficult to find papers without explainability in the title, in, in some sense. Uh, so a very large uh, set of um, approaches and so on. And what is especially interesting, I think, with the, the talk of uh, Joao is that uh, he will give us a perspective uh, which comes from his background on, on KR. And uh, so, of course, he's very well known for uh, his work on, on SAT solvers and so on. So I think it, it will be very interesting uh, uh, from that perspective to, to have uh, his take on, uh, on this uh, very lively topic. Uh, so Joao is a director de recherche at CNRS, research director at CNRS. He's also the chair of uh, um, an ANITI, uh, so this uh, Troia uh, at Toulouse, uh, share on deep learner explanation and verification, if I'm right, and uh, don't hesitate to correct me, Joao. And um, yes, so he will uh, give us a talk on formal reasoning methods in explainable AI. Joao, the virtual floor is yours. Uh, th <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, so as uh, the introducer uh, mentioned, the title of my talk is Formal Reasoning Methods in Explainable AI. <clears throat> so um, for those that might not know my name or my work, so uh, until very recently, my work was, as was mentioned, on automated reasoning, uh, such solving, uh, inconsistency analysis, through systems, uh, model checking, enumeration uh, of solutions, and so on. Uh, more recently, uh, over the last few years, I've been working with, with my co-workers on explainability and interpretability in machine learning. Um, I, I, actually, for explainability, we started more or less in 2019, so two years ago. And uh, essentially, what we have been trying to do is how can we apply automated reasoning and formal reasoning techniques in, in machine learning? So we are all familiar with the many successes of uh, machine learning. Uh, um, we have uh, image and speech recognition where uh, the capacity of, of machine learning systems is above uh, what a human can do. Uh, we have self-driving cars. We have uh, the, uh, intelligent dig digital assistants. Uh, DeepMind proposed a bunch of uh, different solutions for systems that can play games and can learn how to play games and we have uh, significant advances in robotics. At the same time, um, people uh, have, uh, have come to accept that machine learning models are what, they, what the people call brittle, so they are fragile. Uh, one one well-known example are adversarial examples. So this is a, an, an image of a, of a panda, uh, and it was, um, this was from seven years ago, more or less, and the, the, the neural network could recognize this image as a panda, now, if you put a little bit of, of, what, of noise over the image and you, you get this image, which for us humans is essentially the same, uh, the machine learning system would then classify this image as a given. And this uh, got uh, researchers to be, become worried about uh, how robust the machine learning uh, models would be. And there are um, more, uh, many other examples that have been uh, developed over the years, and some of them can, uh, start uh, becoming troublesome. So a stop signal that uh, it can be interpreted as a speed limit, as a reasonable speed limit, 
or, or even worse. And these, so these two examples are more recent. And uh, essentially people discovered that they could do whatever essentially they, they wanted with machine learning systems. So this is an image of a pig. You put a very small amount of noise and you get uh, airliner uh, for, uh, in terms of what the machine learning system would, would um, classify. Now, these are, uh, some of these are two examples. Uh, some of them can be very problematic. Uh, uh, this is an example of um, a, a tumor, uh, and it, it's a benign tumor, uh, with, uh, and, and it was classified as a benign tumor, as it's shown here. Now, you put a little bit of noise, and you get what for us is, is essentially the same image, and it is now classified as a malignant tumor. And of course, you can swap you can swap the images and you can see um, the, the, the problems that you can, you can identify. Um, now, what people also um, accept is that some models are usually considered interpretable. And this, for this, you have decision uh, uh, rules and decision sets, decision trees, rule lists, um, a, a, a large number of models. And I have here, um, Example. So this is an example of a decision tree. This is an example of a bunch of rules. So for example, a decision set, because since we don't have order, we don't call it a decision means. But some other models and people uh, over the last few years have been more enthusiastic about these models. They are not interpretable. Essentially, they operate as a, a black box. And the well-known example are neural networks. So you, you put an image of a cat. Uh, and you get uh, the correct prediction, which is um, the, it is a cat. But um, essentially the question is, why does the neural network predict the cat? So, uh, and we have other questions, which features, given a large number of features, which features are important and uh, whether we can, uh, we can understand general trends regarding the, the, the prediction. So uh, the uh, original definition of XAI around 2017 was this one. So you have a machine learning system, which correctly predicts, uh, for example, an image, and you get the correct um, a prediction. So it's a cat, and that was the explanation at the time. And what people wanted was, uh, can we get more information? So why is it being classified as a cat? And so this is where we, we started from. Um, at the same time, um, uh, for example, in Europe, uh, uh, the European Parliament approved what is called the GDPR, and uh, some authors um, view that as a, a, an entitlement of people uh, to explanations uh, when um, an algorithm or an alg a system that uses machine learning is being used. Uh, and the, um, DARPA created this program in 2017, as I mentioned before, the US started to approve uh, what, the, what was called at the time uh, Algorithmic Accountability Act and so on. And um, a, few, a couple of years ago, some authors uh, essentially um, proposed a, a good justification for why we need uh, explainability. So in order for us to, to, to trust uh, what is being deployed, which uh, the, the AI systems that are being deployed, we need to improve robustness. And this has been, is being, was being done. But we also need to understand the way uh, the reasoning is being, uh, takes place. And so this is a, a, a very important case for, for explainability. Uh, more recently, a couple of years ago, um, the, um, the AI level group um, of experts um, proposed the ethic guidelines for trustworthy AI. And uh, among the, the, a number of guidelines, there was the principle of explicability, which essentially uh, um, argue that explicability of machine learning models would be uh, fundamental, okay? And um, uh, this slide is actually old. At the time I was arguing that there, there were yeah, hundreds of papers on X, uh, XAI. And these days there are, as one uh, my introducer mentioned, uh, thousands, literally thousands of papers on, on XAI. So um, what we have been doing uh, since uh, one year and a half ago, uh, with the deep level chair in Anity, or has been to apply formal methods in different areas of, of machine learning. So uh, synthesis and learning, verification, robustness, fairness, and the, the, uh, the topic of the talk, uh, explanations. So in terms of explanations, we, we essentially, what we started out to, to understand was what is a rigorous explanation? And so how should we compute explanations? Um, 
can we compute rigorous explanations efficiently? Uh, so this means tractable explanations. Can we have high level explanations, for example? Uh, can we have heuristic explanations with guarantees? And uh, how good are heuristic explanations, uh, at least what existed at the time? And, and uh, I will make available the slides. And so these are references to some of the papers we, we published over the years. Uh, in terms of learning, we have also developed uh, machine learning models um, that are interpretable and for which we can ensure uh, guarantees. For example, um, they are uh, minimum size, for example. But there are other questions. For example, can we synthesize for robustness? Can we synthesize for fairness? And these are some of these questions are yet to be, to be addressed. Uh, in fairness, uh, uh, a huge question is which criteria to use in terms of fairness. And we proposed uh, one uh, last year uh, at CP. And uh, we, we studied data, data set bias, model fairness, and we showed that there are important links with explainability and robustness as well. And finally, there, there is the issue of robustness, which actually it's where the, the importance of automated reasoning and formal methods started to be important in machine learning. And here, uh, the, the, the deep level chairs, we don't have yet any work, but these are some of the topics we think are important. So uh, a huge drawback are uh, reasoning efficiency, uh, for example, to reason about neural networks. Uh, can we, and then of course, in, in this, in the area of automated reasoning, can we, we have a, a more effective or more compact uh, encodings? And of course, can we have alternatives to neural networks? Uh, so the talk of today has two, two parts. Again, I don't know the background of everyone and the, this talk is usually intended for a diff different audiences. So I will talk very briefly about uh, how can we use logic to reason about machine learning models. And then I will um, talk about explainability. So I organized the talk in, in four parts, essentially what are formal explanations, um, uh, abductive explanations and contrasted, contrasted explanations. Uh, I'm going to, to talk briefly about how we have been assessing the quality of existing heuristic uh, explanation approaches. And then I will delve into two topics that we have put some recent effort on, which are tractable explanations and duality in explanations. Okay, um, so well, let's start. Um, so I, uh, we need a few, uh, a few definitions. So, you, um, so I will use the standard machine learning lingo. So we have a, a set of features, which for us are just the one to N and each feature takes values from some domain. Um, and in general, uh, features can be categorical, they can be ordinal, they can be discrete or they can be real value. And uh, we uh, associate with the features, the feature space, which is the Cartesian product of the domains. Uh, and we can view a machine learning model as computing a classification function, which maps the feature space to um, a set of classes. Uh, in this talk, I will usually restrict the classes to two, to two plus and minus, just to illustrate the, the ideas, but in general, we focus on multiple classes. And, uh, when I talk about an instance, I'm talking about the point in feature space and the associated class. So the class is the, the function computed by the machine learning model on, on, on the feature point. Sometimes I'll mix, I'll talk about example, sample or point. Uh, this will be clear from context. And uh, when, whenever convenient, we'll see the point in feature space as a set of literals where we say that the variable associated with the feature is equal to the value given to the feature, given to the point in feature space. And for Boolean features, we can just use standard uh, negation, not XI or XI. <clears throat> so um, um, we, we, we are going to talk several times about intelligence. So it's important that we, we uh, everybody's familiar with it. I know that many of you are extremely familiar, but some of you might not be. And so we are going to consider a function from feature space to zero one for simplicity. And we have some other functions. So this is our function phi and we have some other function tau that is also mapping feature space to zero one. And uh, we say that uh, the, the second form of tau entails the first form of uh, phi and this is notation tau entails phi if for any point in feature space when tau is true, then phi is true, okay? And uh, a different way to represent this is, uh, uh, well, we, we essentially, with this, we want this to be true or we want this to be false. And essentially this is a satisfiability test, which uh, for us that we work with 
constraints or, or satisfiability, it's easier to, to reason about. So as an example, uh, we have feature space, um, zero, one square. And uh, so this is an example of a, a function. And uh, I, I, given the definition, I, I hope it's clear that x1 entails uh, phi. So whenever x1 is true, for sure phi is true. And whenever not true, x1 is true, for sure phi is also true, okay? And this is a more complicated example now with three features. And uh, uh, we have a, two conjunctions and a disjunction. And it's again clear that if this conjunction is true, x1 and x2 is true, then for sure the function is true. And if the second conjunction is true, the same. Uh, when we have non-Boolean features, what we usually do is uh, we, we, we are interested in a specific prediction for some class. And so we talk about the predicate uh, given the class, which is, is the function uh, on some point equal to the class. And then this is defined on zero one, okay? So why do we, why do we need entailment? Because we need a prime implicants to talk about and the implicates as well, but I'm going to focus mostly on prime implicants. We need prime implicants to talk about uh, explanations. So we say that the conjunction of literals uh, pi and whenever, whenever con convenient, this is a set of literals essentially, it's a prime implicant of some function if pi entails a function. And more importantly, any subset of pi does not entail the function. So for example, uh, for this function, uh, it is clear, uh, for example, uh, this is the previous, one of the previous examples, x1 and x2, it has a function, so it's, a, uh, it's a, an implicant. And it's an implicant because any subset, x1 or x2, does not entail the function. We can also introduce uh, prime implicants. Uh, it's essentially, it's instead of conjunction, it's disjunction, and we work the other way around. I'm not going to cover this in the talk, so just to say it also exists. And for those of you that have uh, um, uh, seen these things before, uh, we can essentially, when we talk about finding primes, uh, implicants or implicates, this essentially is the same as finding um, MUSs. And then an MUS is a minimal and satisfiable subset of constraints. So we have a bunch of constraints and we are interested in finding a subset minimal set of constraints. So let me show you that logic is, so uh, a misconception that you, I usually come across is that people say logic, cannot be used in machine learning because it's too restrictive. And so uh, I have a few examples showing this is of course not true. So uh, suppose you have this very simple uh, uh, machine learning model. So two features, x1 and x2, where they can take values 0, 1, or 2. So in, in teacher, uh, the features are integers restricted to 0, 1, 2. And you have two rules. If 2x1 plus x2 greater than 0, you predict plus. If 2x1 minus x2 less than or equal to zero, then you predict, uh, predict minus. So um, an, a, a, a reasonable question is, can the model predict both plus and minus for some instance? And um, uh, the answer is of course, yes. If you pick uh, x1 equals zero and x2 equals one. So here you have a one greater than zero and uh, minus one less than or equal to zero. So you will predict plus and minus at the same time. So of course here you are not computing a function. So uh, we can formalize this. Uh, we, we say that yp, so it's, I'm going to predict plus if this is true, if and only if this is true. And uh, the, this is, uh, I pick negative if and only if this is true. And I want to pick positive and negative at the same time. And because I have inequalities, I will just call a, a satisfiability model theory sol solver, which is essential generalization of such solvers. So there is a, exists a model, if and only if there exists a point in feature space where I can have both predictions. Uh, um, so let me give you yet another example. Now in this case, I'm restricting the features to be Boolean. And I have uh, now three rules. So um, I can predict plus in the with the first rule and then minus with the other two rules, okay? And again, I can ask the question, can I predict both plus and minus uh, for some instance? And we can use the same techniques that I showed before. So uh, the answer in this case is yes. Uh, and it takes a little bit of time to think about it, but yes, we can find a point where you can predict both. And you can formalize this. So uh, you can only pick plus in one case, but you can predict minus in two cases. And so you predict uh, minus uh, if one or the other is true, if and only if one or the other is true, and then you want to pick both. And again, in this case, because everything is Boolean, you just use a SAT solver. And you, if there is a model, then you know that you can predict both predictions. 
Okay. Now these are again people with some people in machine learning will say, well, this is pretty easy. How about more um, serious uh, machine learning models? And so uh, we jump to uh, what can be viewed as a pretty sophisticated machine learning model, a neural network. And um, so uh, it's multi-layer. We have a, um, for simplicity, we have a hidden layer, but we could have multiple hidden layers. And uh, each layer, um, this is just input. So each layer will be viewed as a block. And the, the block operates as follows. We compute an intermediate value X prime. So X prime represents all the values here. Uh, given a, a, a matrix of weights A, uh, we can have some bias factors. So it does not depend on the inputs. And we have an input X. And then as soon as we have this, uh, what we do is we compute the output. Uh, uh, given some the, the intermediate value and some activation function. And what we do is we use you know, what people usually do when we use formal methods for simplicity and only for simplicity, we use the ReLU activation function, which is shown here. So, um, so uh, what I just said can be formalized as follows. X prime is uh, the, the, the multiplication of the, the weight matrix by X, the input, then the sum with the bias vector, and then I take the max this is the ReLU operator between X prime and, and zero, okay? So how can we model this? And we can model this, for example, with mixed integer linear programming as follows. So what we do is um, um, for, for, each, for each term here, what we do is we do a summation. So we have a component on B and we sum all the A's on, on some uh, row with, um, with each XJ. And of course, this summation can either be positive or negative. And so we use two, two, uh, two variables. Both of them are positive, but as follows. So uh, YI is positive, SI is positive. And I use, uh, well, I use actually, this was proposed three years ago by Fisketti and, and Joe. And uh, what we do is we use the Boolean variable, which says only one of them uh, will be uh, less than or equal to zero. And because they are positive, uh, no negative, this means that one of them will be zero. And the other one will be, will be, um, at, will take some value. Now, if the summation is positive, I put the value in yi and the uh, si is zero. Otherwise, I need to put the negative value somewhere. So I, I essentially I use the si, the select variable to take that value. Okay. The model for some people might look a little bit complicated and uh, there are indeed simpler models, but in practice, this has been shown to be the most effective. Uh, a group of people showed this three years, uh, four years ago. Uh, so uh, the, the, the message I'd like to convey is that uh, uh, modeling with machine learning models uh, with logic is, is possible and in general, quite simple. So it's, there, is, there are no limitations by using logic to reason about machine learning models. So let's talk about explainability. Um, so I will, it's organized in four parts, formal explanations, assessing heuristic explanations, tractable explanations, and then duality. So, um, so again, we have categorical, uh, in this case, just for simplicity, we have categorical features. Uh, we take from, from some domain, as I mentioned before, feature space, as I mentioned before, two classes, as I mentioned before as well. And we have some prediction, even some point in feature space. So we are going to focus on a point in feature space. We have some prediction and we are going to reason about it. Notation is that we, for simplicity, we just use some L denoting that the, the function predicts C, okay? And each point, as I also mentioned earlier, can be viewed as a set of literals, so a cube uh, where the, the feature associated, sorry, the variable associated with the features takes the value of the point in feature space. So what do we have? Uh, we have the, the input and uh, this is our cube. It's a conjunction of literals. We have the, the model, and uh, so we will represent it as M, and we can have a, a, a logical encoding as I showed before for this uh, model. So we can use SAT or SMT or CP or ILP, it depends on, on the type of machine learning model. And then we have a prediction, which is again a literal, uh, and we just have to encode the literal. And so we know for sure that as, as, as long as we have the input and the model, we are going to predict the, the output, okay? And, and so we can view this as a propositional abduction. There are easier ways. This is how we got to, 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 to this result. So we have a bunch of hypotheses, my input Q. We have a theory, uh, the, the model, and then the manifestation is the observation that we have at the output. And what we want to find is 
uh, a, a subset or a cardinality minimal set of, of um, inputs of the features such that uh, we have consistency between the cube and the model and the uh, what we pick and the model entails a prediction. So a few observations. Uh, the first one is a tautology because again, we are just taking out in, in features from the input. So that we will not get inconsistency for sure. Um, this, and the second one, we can uh, rewrite it as follows. So instead of SCM and M equals L, we just write it as CM equals M. Uh, implies L. And so CM is an essential time implicant of, of this function. Now we can um, compute subset or cardinality minimal prime implicants, and usually this impacts uh, complexity. So, um, so again, uh, something that is important is that as soon as we have this, when we compute CM for any instance in feature space that is consistent with CM, with this set of literals, even the model, we are going to, we are assured to get a prediction. So this is very important. So this is how, what we, we view as an explanation. Okay, so uh, it's a set of literals that we pick that, get, that is sufficient for the prediction and it's subset minimal or, or cardinality minimal. Okay, so uh, an algorithm to compute a subset minimal explanation is actually easy if you, if you have entailment. So you go through the literals of, of the input cube Take, it, take each one out, check entailment, and if you have entailment, you drop the literal. Okay, so you, you need a, a number of calls to the entailment oracle that uh, grows with the number of, of features. Uh, again, we can get some prime, it's a, set, it's a prime implicant, um, so a subset minimal, but it's not cardinality minimal. And we can show, we also have a talk this, uh, about this shortly, this reduces to a very well known topic in, in method reasoning and USA extraction. Uh, if you want cardinality minimal explanation, as I mentioned a few slides back, this is usually some, some, somewhat more um, com complex. And so this is a possible algorithm. We still use the entailment oracle, but we need to compute a minimum heating set of a set of constraints that we are producing iteratively. So the number of times we repeat this cycle can be exponential, and each time we call the entailment oracle and the minimum heating set algorithm. So it computes the smallest prime, as I said, but um, as, uh, in terms of, uh, from a computational perspective, it's much more inefficient, okay? So, um, so it's what I just talked about is that we have a way to target mi uh, minimal conditions for prediction that, that are sufficient. And so we are equating explanations with prime implicants. And if you prefer a different way to, to, to formalize a, a, a subset, it's a, what we are saying is that for each point in, for any point in feature space, if the set of literals that we pick is true, then the prediction is going to be uh, what we, we started from. Again, assuming that the prediction is plus, of course. Uh, now this is uh, uh, relating explanations with prime implicants is being studied by different groups. And so these are some references. Again, th this might not be, um, the, the most up-to-date, but it shows some of the original references of people also doing equating explanations with uh, prime implicants. Uh, very well, so let's now see why uh, we can relate PI explanations of prime implicants with MUSs. So the statement that I showed in the previous slide is that any point in feature space, if the set of literals is true, the conjunction of the set of literals is true, then the prediction is plus. And our goal is to find this uh, subset uh, of the literals such that this is still true. Uh, what we are saying is that alternatively, you can say that trying to find the point in feature space where we have the set of cubes true and the prediction different from plus is a false statement. And so uh, this part here is unsatisfiable. Why is this important? Because essentially now we can compute the minimal unsatisfiable subset for this, for this formula. So the, the, this part here, we cannot change. This is the prediction, it's our model. Uh, this part here are the soft constraints. Essentially, we can drop literals. And, and so we can find a minimal set. So a minimal set of literals such that women, everything is unsatisfiable. And that is uh, MUS extraction. So why is this? This is interesting because we have well-known uh, characterizations of MUS extraction. So in most cases, when I say most cases, most machine learning models, the complexity class is FPMP. So I need a linear number of calls to an NP oracle uh, to find an MUS. But uh, if I want the smallest MUS, the complexity class, uh, competence in some cases and some other case membership, 
it's FP to the sigma 2P. So again, uh, significantly more complex. So going back to the neural network example, we now know that if we, we are given a neural network with a travel activation function, we can essentially do an encoding. And this is what we did um, two years ago. Uh, so here, this is the reference. And uh, these are a bunch of data sets we analyzed at the time. And by the way, we did this, of course, with neural networks, as I just said, and we considered SNT and MILP solvers. And as you, uh, what we discovered at the time is several things. So first, as expected, minimal explanations are much easier to compute than minimal explanations. Uh, we can see, so these are the number of features, and this is the minimum average and maximum uh, explanation that we could observe. And so sometimes, well, sometimes it's not interesting, sometimes it's very interesting. So it depends a lot on, on the type of problem. Um, and we, uh, we also noticed that MI, MILP solver, so uh, CPLEX was more e efficient than an SAT solver for this complete example, and neural network, I mean. And we also observed that uh, minimal explanations, as expected, are in general much more comp difficult to compute. Okay. And uh, we, we did not really observe very significant differences between subset minimal and cutting out in minimal. And uh, again, this justifies the, the, the use of prime implicants instead of smallest prime implicants. Uh, so uh, to our best knowledge, it was the first rigorous approach for explaining neural networks two years ago, as I said. Uh, the downside is that we could scale to a few tens of neurons. And again, this is a, a, a universal way of for what people expect to be able to do, to do in terms of reasoning about the neural networks, okay? So if you, for those of you that uh, feel disappointed, don't be disappointed. So these are more recent results. Uh, actually, they are going to be presented at each guy uh, for random forests. And in this case, we are now capable of reasoning in terms of essentially uh, re completely realistic uh, random forests. And so, um, so this is the depth of each tree in the random forest. This is the total number of nodes. So as you can see, there are some, there are some pretty significant large uh, random forests here. Uh, we have reasonable accuracies and, uh, um, and we have a comparison. So this is the, 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 the time that we take to, to compute the PI explanation. So minimum average and maximum time. And uh, percent, percent W is how many times we are more efficient than Anchor. And uh, for those that are not, I'm going to talk about Anchor shortly, but Anchor is a realistic explainer. So, uh, and what we discover is that for a random forest of realistic size, very realistic size, we are in general much, much more efficient than Anchor. And we guarantee the quality of explanations. So these are, I think, good news. So uh, meaning that uh, the application of automated reasoning in machine learning, for some machine learning types of machine learning models is right now uh, uh, feasible, okay? Uh, let me just go back. Notice that in terms of wins, Anchor is, so with a few ex very small exceptions, so uh, it's in general uh, slower. And as you can see from the average, significantly slower than, than our tool. And again, our tool is just a prototype uh, written in, in Python uh, through using PySAT for those that know what I'm talking about. Uh, very good. So um, what we did also for the last the two years is uh, we understand that, for example, for neural networks, uh, it, um, rigorous approaches might not scale. And so can we use heuristic approaches? Of course, that is a natural solution. And so what we try to do is we ask the question, okay, so um, there are heuristic approaches, are they, are they uh, any good? And so we, we tried three, Lime, which uh, was Sharp and Anchor. All of these are extremely well known. They are highly feasible. If you search these papers, you'll understand what I'm talking about. And uh, so we, tr we use two different ways of assessing the quality of heuristic explanations. So um, for those that are not familiar, a very quick, very quick overview, Lime and Sharp and Anchor, they are somewhat different. So here in Lime and Sharp, the goal is that uh, you learn a very simple inter interpretable machine learning model, so linear classifier or decision tree. And there are two different approaches. You can train the classifier. <clears throat> this is what Lime does. Uh, you just sample the, the, fi the feature space and according to the distribution and you train the classifier or you use game theory. This is what um, uh, Sharp does. So essentially uh, 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 you use this to, to learn a, a simpler model that behaves more or less like the original model. And the, if you want to do, so this is uh, Sharp is uh, based on uh, this approach, game theory based approach. 
uh, some re recent results, so it's, uh, if you want the exact solution, it's sharply hard uh, for some classes of models. So it's either you, it's very realistic approach or you also have the complexity issues. Anchor is different. So uh, uh, you essentially you learn features that are deemed more relevant. So here is, you learn a model, here you just learn the features. So this is somewhat similar to the, the prime implicate explanations that I've been talking about. And Anchor is also sample based. So none of these approaches gives any formal guarantees of rigor in the, the explanations that are computed. So this is important to, to observe. So uh, the first experiment that we did was uh, asking this question. So what is the overall quality of heuristic explanations when you compute some heuristic explanations? So you have the heuristic explanation, then you ask the question, is this any good? So what we did is it was as follows. So we learned a machine learning model. Um, we used boosted trees using XGBoost for those that know what I'm talking about. Again, it's just a, 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 um, a tree ensemble uh, that, uh, that is widely used and quite successful. Uh, and then you compute a heuristic explanation using one of the tools I mentioned before. And then you use our approach to measure the quality of the heuristic explanation. Well, so in, in, in the sense of whether it is or it is not a API explanation. So we have three possible cases. If, it, if it's not true, so if you don't have entitlement, so if it's not true, if, if it does not hold globally the, the, the explanation computed by this model, you fix it, so you correct it. And in this case, you say that explanation is incorrect, so it's not really sound, uh, because the set of little is not sufficient for the prediction. If it go, holds globally, but it has redundant literals, then we refine it. And in this case, we say it's redundant because the set of littles is sufficient, but there are littles that you really don't need. And otherwise, you well, in that, otherwise you just have a PI explanation and you report it. Uh, so uh, I mentioned random forest uh, here. Uh, when we did this experiment, this was two years ago. We could scale to realistic, but not really uh, the, the size of trees that would be used in practice. So with random forest, we scale to to size that are used in practice. So this is just a summary of what we are doing. So we compute an explanation, we, we assess whether it's correct. If it is, we refine it if necessary, otherwise we don't. And if it's not correct, we, we repair it. And just an example. So this is a, a very simplistic uh, uh, boosted tree, very, very simplistic. So we use seven trees, one for each class. And uh, this is an example instance. So if you have these um, uh, features, then the class you're going to predict is reptile. Which is uh, so this one is going to fire, and the other ones are not, um, are going to fire a, a, a more negative value. Or and uh, if you if you run anchor, uh, you get this. So you get uh, not air, not milk, not fins, not two. okay. So um, uh, a reasonable interpretation is that um, uh, you have this. So as long as you have not air, not milk, not tooth, not fins, you are going to predict a uh, reptile, okay. And um, what we discovered is that the explanation is already incorrect uh, on training data. So there are instances in training data where the prediction should be different and the, 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 predict the, the explanation is both true. So you have not hair, not milk, not tooth, not fins. So you, should, you, you would say, well, I would have reptile, but actually should be getting uh, amphibian. So some results that we got. Uh, so these are five data sets that we analyzed at the time. And these are the percent incorrect, the percent redundant, and the percent correct for different tools. Um, as you can see, uh, the number of incorrect explanations, given the measure, that, the, the metric that I mentioned, can go up to 99.7%. So essentially, all of the explanations are incorrect. So you have to fix all of them. Okay. And by the way, so a few years uh, a year and a half ago, uh, Google announced this, uh, an XAI service, which seemed very similar to Sharp-like approach. So you, you, you can see Sharp is not as bad as Lime or Anchor, but it's still lots of incorrect predictions. So another question you can ask is, okay, you can, you can get incorrect results, that's fine, but how often uh, are the, the, the heuristic explanations consistent with the prediction? So, so it could happen that it's 90% of the time you, you, it's correct, it, you, you just, you can find an example where it breaks, but in general, it's okay. So we also, so what we did in this case, we needed a different setup. So we needed the subbased encoding because we needed to use model counting. So we used bin binarized neural networks and we computed the heuristic explanations with Anchor. Again, we, we got the similar results with Sharp and Lime. And then we use a, we had to use an approximate model counter to assess how often the explanation is consistent with the prediction. 
So this uh, uh, shows the, what the results we got at the time. So these are the instances essentially that we tried, and this is the, the, the precision estimate. So anchor, so are the, the non-deft uh, lines, as you can see, it's usually quite happy with, with its prediction, saying it's confident with 99% precision. Uh, our, our measures uh, for different data sets is, are quite, quite different. So we can even have ex in, in instances for which uh, uh, the precision is 40%, less than 40%. So the bottom line is that our results demo uh, demonstrate that really the, the precision is um, uh, proposed by Anchor is really not realistic, okay? So, um, Again, so I, I hope that the, these two examples uh, underscore the importance of formal explanations and a different way to, de to develop heuristic explanations. Okay, so let me talk a little bit now about uh, tractable explanations. So um, I started the talk by saying, well, you, you can have the interpretable models and an example of the interpretable model is a decision tree. And this has been uh, really, uh, people have been convinced that decision trees are interpretable at least for 20 years, two decades. And we, we are, I'm going to show you in this slide that this is not really the case. So, um, so uh, by the way, if you, you, if you look at this decision tree, it's really um, minimal. So you cannot get a simpler decision tree. So let me ask you some questions. So let's analyze the instance uh, one, zero, one, one. So one, zero, one, one. So you're going to predict plus, okay? Now, you can ask the, the question, well, why is the prediction plus? Um, so I would like to compute the P explanation uh, for this prediction when the instance is one, zero, one, one. So let's do some analysis. So first question, does the prediction change if X1 is allowed to take any value in zero, one? So what I'm saying is that I, I'm going to, allow x1 to take zero or one, but because x3 and x4 are one, I'm going to guarantee that I'm going to predict plus. So the answer is no. So I, I don't really care about the value of x1. So the next question is, does the prediction change if I, I allow x2 and x1 to take any value? So here we don't even have x2. So the answer is of course, it does not change. So the prediction does not change. So what have I just showed is that a, a PI explanation is x3 equals one and x4 equals one. Okay, so uh, as long as what I'm saying is that as long as x3 equals one and x4 e e equals one, I can assure you the decision tree is going to predict uh, plus no matter the other ones. Uh, and so uh, what we, we argued uh, in, in, in this report is that uh, there are functions like this one, we can generalize this function where some pads are going to grow with the number of features and the p explanation is of constant size. So you can, you can be arbitrarily bad in terms of the number of features with respect to the explanation that you could provide, right? So you could ask, okay, that is a concocted example. Uh, does that occur in practice? Sorry, let me go back. And the answer is, yes, we found this all over the place. So we, we looked at some books, Russell and Norris books. So this is a very well-known example. This is a restaurant example. And uh, so if you put, uh, so if you consider the instance full, yes, tie, no, so the prediction is no. Uh, uh, we, sorry, let me go back. It's easy to, to prove that angry being yes or no is irrelevant. And so you can drop that feature. So this is um, uh, Zeus book on three ensembles. And um, again, if you consider a specific instance, so y is uh, not greater than 0, 0.73, and when uh, x is greater than uh, 0, 0.64, so it's, the prediction is cross. And immediately because the prediction is cross, it means that y, the, the value of y is irrelevant because if you change the value of y, you, you are going to get cross anyway, okay? Uh, another book, Alpidin's book, the same analysis, it's just the features that are different, but you get the same analysis. Uh, Pull in the course book, also very well known book in AI. So here, you actually, we found two examples. So if, if, if you have short follow-up and known skips, so that means that length is irrelevant. If it's known, that means that thread is irrelevant. So we can drop again features in, in both cases. So how do we compute explanations for decision trees? So of course, we, the, 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 the what I proposed before, we could use it, so we can just use NP oracles, but then it's worst case exponential time. And in this case, it's really not needed. 
So uh, if the prediction is plus, as in the example I showed, it, we, we just need to ensure that all the pads that give minus, prediction minus, are remaining consistent, okay? And so, so what I, I need to do is find the subset minimal heating set of all the, the pads that have a, a prediction minus. And so these are the features that I need to keep. And this is well known to be solved in polynomial time. Again, a subset minimal, not cardinality. So in this case, again, it's very easy to implement this algorithm. And these are some results. And again, I, it's a, a very busy table. And I just want to highlight that the, uh, so percent, uh, I, we try two different tools, interpretable AI, uh, commercial tool, and ITI. And the percentage of redundant pads can be quite significant in um, a huge number of, of uh, data sets. So uh, just to say that the, the redundancy, uh, so the, 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 the fact that you need explanations in decision trees occurs in the, in the, the examples in the books, in the examples I showed, but also in the, the trees that you get from different data sets. Okay, and by the way, so uh, I forgot. Uh, uh, so this is the percentage redundant. This is the average number of redundant literals. As you can see there, it can be a quite nice, a significant number of redundant literals in, 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 in pads that, that have redundant uh, uh, literals. So um, two more, th uh, one, this is one example where we compute explanations in polynomial time. Another example where we show that we can compute explanations in polynomial time are naive base classifiers. And here, actually, we, we showed slightly slight something stronger. You can not only find explanations in polynomial time, but you can enumerate explanations with polynomial delay. And the result holds for a naive base and for linear classifiers. So again, I'm just going to hand wave a lot because it, it can get a little bit technical. So we start from uh, naive base classifiers, and then uh, we... Um, transform the, the, the naive base classifier into an, an intermediate representation, um, extended linear classifiers. And then we compute an inter, a number of intermediate quantities. These are the ones I'm going to jump. And then we map this into a uh, modified NEPSEC problem and uh, we, get, we get the result. So um, just an example of a naive base classifier. Uh, so uh, uh, the, 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 this is my class. So the, the prediction, um, of, uh, of the class is 90%. And uh, so these are the, the features, R1, R2, R3, and R4. And uh, for those that have seen this before, the, uh, uh, so the, the, what we predict given some evidence, so values on R, R4, R3, R2, and R1 is the R max for all the possible classes of the probability of the class given the, the evidence that you started from. Okay, and so um, again, because this is uh, a, 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 a Bayesian network, you can uh, ex expand the probability, the conditional probability as follows, and um, you can um, actually transform the product uh, into a, a sum of logarithms. This is one known. So, and you you can put a, 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 a translation so that all the values are positive. And um, so essentially, instead of using log pro of probability, we just use L pro for the pro log probability. And so um, it's the R max for all the classes of this summation. So again, this is, uh, I'm going to show later that this is easier to, to compute than uh, the previous, the starting uh, uh, expression. So uh, for a complete example, so if you put one, zero, one, 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 zero, one, one, um, you have the different probabilities and then the probability given the, the evidence that you start from. So you have, you get two values. So the probability of minus given the evidence, probability of plus given the evidence, you pick the, the one that is highest, so you pick uh, plus, okay? And um, so um, so this is the naive base classifier. We introduced in, in, in this paper uh, an extended linear classifier, which is a standard linear classifier plus a selector operator, a sum of selector operators, where you pick some value, sorry, given some evidence, you pick one of these values. So EJ can take one of these values. And what we showed is that you can reduce the naive base classifier to the extended linear classifier, and then you just reason in terms of the extended linear classifier. Uh, so what we need to do is we need to eliminate the max operator. So with two classes, it's easy to do. And so we say, we do the difference and we want the, uh, the difference so, uh, to be greater than zero. And then we just need to, to map uh, these uh, quantities to the, 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 the variables I have for the XLC for the selector operator. And uh, so 
again, we need to introduce, as I said, a few additional um, uh, um, um, definitions. And the, the, what we showed is that this is a special case of NAPSEC that we can solve in log-linear time and we can enumerate with uh, log-linear delay solutions. So um, comparison with what existed at the time. So um, uh, there was a tool already step and first, just the raw performance of our tools. So um, we can we 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 analyze the close to one hundred thousand uh, instances, and we um, the, the goal here was to enumerate one million explanations. Again, uh, one million explanations is really a very significant large number of explanations, and you can see the running time is usually negligible. Now, first step step is compilation based. So first you need to compile, and then you need to compute explanations. So the, uh, the we could. Uh, most of the instances that we analyzed could not be compiled. So we could compile just a few, uh, nine if I recall correctly. And after compilation, uh, we were still uh, an order of magnitude uh, more or less uh, faster than, uh, than uh, the compiled uh, representation for computing uh, PI explanations. Okay, so uh, let me now talk briefly about duality in explanations. And so until now I've been talking about PI explanations or what we call abductive explanations. So it's a minimal set of literals that is sufficient for the prediction. And this is, so I have a set of literals and for all the points in feature space, as long as uh, the, fit, the, the points, the, the features that I identified take the value I started from, then I'm, I'm going to guarantee the prediction. Uh, a contrastive explanation is slightly different. So it's a minimal set of literals that is sufficient for changing the prediction. So there exists a point in feature space such that uh, for the points that are not, for the, the features that are not in that set, if I take the value, I, I'm able to get a different prediction. Uh, what we proved um, recently, um, so the paper is, um, there was a report and there is a paper coming out, is that uh, um, objective explanations are minimal eating sets of contrastive explanations and vice versa. Now, some people asked several times, why, why, why bother about this? And the answer is that we can compute one from the other. So if we want to, in general, if we want to enumerate explanations, um, this allows us to do it, okay? Otherwise we would not have a way to enumerate explanations. So, uh, and what, well, if, what we have shown a few years ago in a different setting, but we have put to this to mind is that we can enumerate a, a abductive and contrastive explanations concurrently. So, um, so for those that have are familiar with, with this, actually the, these duality results are go back at least to, until the, the 80s, the, the work of Reiter. So essentially what we are doing here is rephrasing the work, uh, the results of Reiter in the context of explanations. Okay, uh, we also did, uh, so that was specific for PI explanations, subjective explanations and contrastive explanations. We also did some work on global explanations and I'm going to talk a little bit about this and we related it with other examples. So when we did this work two years ago, and there was a, um, already a, a vast, a large body of work on explanations. Most of the, the work was a heuristic. Uh, and there was a vast body of work on uh, analyzing uh, adversarial examples, and uh, both with rigorous and heuristic approaches. And the question we looked at is, can we relate uh, explanations with adversarial examples? And uh, there was some papers, there were some papers from 2017 and 18 saying, yes, there seemed to be a connection, but there was nobody had proposed a formal connection between the two. So what we did is propose the, this, this first link. Uh, again, as before, well, again, we are using it in duality from, uh, First proposed, as far as we know, by writer. So um, let me go back to the restaurant example of uh, 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 the book of Russell and Norvig. And uh, this is a reasonably well known example. Uh, so we have 10, so the features are here. I'm just going to use a different, slightly different notation. So we have 10 features, and uh, some features take the different types of values. Some of them are Boolean, some of them take a range of values. and uh, um, if you if you start with the, the data set I showed in the previous slide, you can, for example, learn this decision set. So you have two rules to predict yes, that you wait at the restaurant, and you have three rules to predict no, that you don't wait at the restaurant. And so uh, we say that uh, a set of literals is a counterexample uh, to some prediction if uh, that set of literals predicts forces the, system, the, the machine learning model to predict something which is different from the class that you have. And a break is um, a 
So a, a literal breaks a set of literals. If S contains a literal that is inconsistent with my, my starting literal. Uh, so if we look at the, the, the prediction, and again, notice that here I don't have an ist, so that's why I'm talking about global explanations. Uh, we can, for example, using the first rule, an explanation would be th that rule, okay? And uh, um, the, the, the last three rules, uh, th three, four, and five are, would be counterexamples. So this is an, an example of a counterexample. And uh, we can see uh, that they need to break each other as I just mentioned. So this one breaks this one and this one breaks this one. So what we essentially prove is that each explanation breaks every counterexample, each counterexample breaks every explanation and uh, um, explanations can be computed by, uh, from all the counterexamples by King centralization and vice versa. And uh, if you have an instance, uh, an adversarial example can be computed from the closest counterexample, okay? And uh, so just uh, this is for what I just talked about. I went very quickly, I would like to finish on time, but it's just to give you um, a, a summary of, of what I talked about. So we have global explanations, the two first rules, and then we have uh, three kind of examples, the rules predicting something else. And then it's easy to see that they are hitting each other as expected. Okay, so what I did over the last hour was to overview the work we have been doing at intersection of automated reasoning and machine learning. I've actually, we have done more than this. I focus on the explainability part. Um, uh, the work uh, offers uh, what, what, we, what, we think, what we think is a viable alternative to heuristic-based solutions. We show that heuristic-based solution can be problematic, and we showed that uh, in some, for some models, either we can solve the analyze those in the normal time, or we can reason efficiently about them. Uh, we don't have a final solution. For example, for neural networks, we don't have a, a, a good solution yet. Um, so as I said, there are many challenges ahead. Uh, scalability is an issue. Um, in some cases, it's a, so it's, as I said, there are examples where we know it's an issue. Uh, there is the perception that, uh, perception that it's always an issue. This, uh, we, don't, we don't agree. Uh, it's an issue, for example, with neural networks, and we don't have yet a good solution. And um, adoption, adoption, meaning people are not yet using this as we felt would be important, given the, the lack of quality of heuristic explanations. So, uh, the, all the evidence that we have suggests that there is no really alternative to the explanations that we are talking about. We and other groups um, uh, in the US and also in France, uh, but uh, it's taking its time. So uh, what, just as a, a, to summarize, uh, what we are trying to do in, at ANIT is explain and verify and learn machine learning models in all cases with guarantees of rigor using automated reasoning tools and techniques. So uh, thank you very much. If you have questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you very much, Jao, for the brilliant talk. Uh, I think it was a, a, a survey of, of your work, absolutely uh, fascinating, and, and I guess many questions. Uh, so please. Uh,